On this episode, I have the great pleasure to chat with Goldie Taylor, Chief Marketing Officer of Morehouse School of Medicine. Goldie is a truly exceptional human being, and one of her many, many gifts is that she is also a talented author. I read her book, Paper Gods, and was so blown away by how great it was that I had to have her on the show to talk about it. It's a political thriller set in Atlanta, and I'm not kidding when I say it's one of my favorite fiction books. You're going to love this one. Okay, I am here with my relatively new friend, Goldie Taylor. Goldie, how are you? Hey, hey, Jenny. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. Okay, I always ask everybody to start by saying who they are and what they do, and I am so curious to hear you answer that question. So, the floor (laughs) is yours. (laughs) I'm not, you know... I don't, I don't know who I am anymore is what I tell my kids. You know, I am, I'm a writer, first of all, right? And so I have written for The Daily Beast, for MSNBC, for CNN. I've been on air with both uh, as an on-air political analyst, you know, in a prior life long ago. I did you know, communications strategy for uh, various political campaigns, state, local, and national. Um, but today, uh, I'm a marketer again. Right. And so I've taken a lifetime of experience of pushing global brands um, like Procter and Gamble or uh, American Airlines, Toyota, North America, uh, Eli Lilly, McDonald's. I've worked with a uh, a cadre of household brand names and I've enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, But today I am chief marketing officer at Morehouse School of Medicine and still a writer. Yeah. And still a writer. And what's amazing to me is um, we, I don't know what we met. When did you start? Eight months ago? Yeah. So we met probably in December of 2019. December. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and yet I just recently read your book, Paper Gods, and you are an amazing writer. Like my first thought was, I can't believe she, that's not all you're doing. Cause it's such a good book. It's such a good book. <laughs> If I could do it every day, I would. <laughs> um, writer's block sometimes gets in the way, but real life kind of gets in the way. Yeah. I have been writing in writing stories specifically. Ever since, you remember those little lines, those manuscript lines that your teacher gave you in the second or third grade to make sure that you could write a story and sure. write sentences in practice? <laughs> the first yeah. time a teacher gave me one of those, she had to take it from me because I had written on the first page as small as I could because I had the story to tell and I flipped it over and and created some more lines and written some more, right? So I've been writing stories um, and creating story all of my life. It's just who I am and what I do. And so Paper Gods was really just another big, you know, story tale from Goldie Taylor. And that, was that your third book? Third novel. Third Third novel. novel. Okay. And when, how old were you and what was the first one? So the first one came out in 2007, and then I think it was quickly followed in 2008 with the second. Okay. First book was sort of that labor of love, and everybody has one. Everybody has a book in them, they say, right? Well, that one was mine. Yeah. Poorly executed, you know, but I look back and go, did you really write that and want to publish it, right? And so I needed to self-publish at the time. I must have queried 250 agents, and every one of them said no. (laughs) That should have been a cue. (laughs) It should have been a cue. Um, I self-published and my mentor, who happened to be president and CEO of Time Inc. Magazine, books, you know, everything that... Uh, who was that? Uh, Don Logan. Okay. Don Logan uh, was head of all of this, had been so because of uh, Ted Turner. And he said, hey, I, I, I like your book. It has some promise. But I have some people who can do something with it. I had no idea what that meant. The next thing I know, my book is in the hands of Carol Barron, who was the head of Double Day Book Club, right? Which at that time, book clubs were huge. Yeah. Uh, and so it went there and it became a book club bestseller. And then the second book contract came right after it. And I must have written that book in 45 days. Wow. Better than the three. Not as good as I could have put on paper. But publishing was changing, right? There were many more self-publishers. Uh, agents were playing different roles. Uh, you know, there was more shelf space out there at the time, but the digital space was coming. Uh, Amazon Books was growing, right? Yeah. So I took 10 years, and I'm, I'm good for doing this. Um, I call myself self-taught. I took off nearly a decade to take a look at how books get written. I felt like I had 
a, a great story in me, but I just hadn't done it, you know, right the first yeah. uh, two, twice, two, first two times around. And so I learned how to rehang a story. I learned how to outline a fiction novel. I learned mm. how to set plot points and develop conflict and character and scene, you know, and that scene is almost a character itself and, and, and getting somebody in the place, right? Yeah. So not just reading the story, but in the story, smelling, feeling, hearing. And so that, from that became Paper Gods. And I had one story of all of this that I was waiting to tell. You remember A Man in Full? Um, Sorry, what? Tom, Tom Wolf, A Man yes. in Full. Yes. This book came out in the early 90s, all about Atlanta fictionalized. And we all read it and we said, that's not Atlanta. Yeah. So I waited all these years to write what I thought was really Atlanta. It is so Atlanta. <laughs> it's so Atlanta, yeah. Um, well, it makes sense to me that you spent so much time to develop, you know, how to write a fiction novel, um, the plot, because it is, you know, I'm not just saying this because I know you, it was really engrossing and the characters like grew on you. And it's interesting because I thought one character was, sort of quote unquote the main character until I started to sort of root for or 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 sort of support the another character and then I've since heard you say that that character is sort of one of them anyways it's just like you really get in it's it's excellent <laughs> it's excellent oh, thank you I think you know it was a labor but I learned to braid right yeah. so braiding several plots and each of those three characters all have their own plot but they're all inextricably intertwined, right? And so yeah. I just, you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't jump double Dutch rope, right? <laughs> Terrible at it. This book is literally double Dutch rope. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's so many sort of themes and threads going through and they all come together. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's fantastic. Um, so let me ask you this real quick. Were, when you were writing it, I know that it you probably developed it over time. When you sat down to sort of really start writing it, was that all you were doing or were you, were you working at the same time, trying to f carve out time on weekends? Like, how did you get the book done? Oh, heavens. You know, you got to go out and make a living, right? And yeah. so from the moment I started that book, I was writing for the Daily Beast. I was a, a contributing opinion writer at the time, became editor at large. I was doing television on MSNBC and CNN at the time. NHLN, like twice a day, all three networks, every day, five days a week. Um, sometimes for free, sometimes paid, right? Um, so you got to make a living. And so that meant waking up really early in the morning. Was that your thing? Early mornings? Early, early morning before the sun rises and nobody can even think about calling you at that time. Right. Yeah. Phone number <laughs> rings says you and your coffee pot, you know, in the starless Atlanta sky. Mm. And so that is how it got done. Um, the book moved with me to New York where I wrote in a loft, you know, in Brooklyn for a while. And when I was, uh, and that's where the final draft came. It went off to the publisher, but I knew as I was hanging the book, as I was outlining the book, that I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be a visual piece. I wanted it either to be a television series or film, right? I wanted this to be um, a larger than life story and it needed larger than life characters. And so when my agent read the full piece, she said, Goldie, I think this is a TV series. And, and some folks from this, this place called WME, you know, called me up and said they'd like to represent it. I go, W who? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, little me. And that's where it started. So, yeah. the, so the book got bigger. You know, it got into more and more people's hands. And suddenly, uh, you know, here we are sitting with a television series coming from ABC next fall. Yeah, I mean, um, and I want to hear how that, happened but i've again i've got so many questions i'm gonna have to pare this down um and i will say like i consider this our conversation uh with goldie the author but i have lots of other conversations i want to have with you so we're, we're i'm going to try real hard to stick this to author um okay so you went to cross keys is that yeah. right high school yeah I, yeah I went to, I went to <laughs> mountain high school we hated them <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we were like rivals. And Redan, um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I hated so him. We, we went to a similar high school situ <laughs> situation. Um, and I guess that that's where I want to start is sort of wanting to write about Atlanta. Um, you, you, you say in the book, um, 
you know, Atlanta is the biggest small town, uh, which is absolutely a thing. Uh, you love Atlanta? I love every moment of it. Love every, every street, every street, every crack, every avenue. Um, love everything about it. I have now been here since 1985. Okay. I, you know, I can't count, but is that 35 years right about, right? Yeah, I think um, so. I have never truly lived anywhere else. A job has taken me to New York, to Cincinnati, to Chicago, to DC, to San Francisco. I've always, always come home to Atlanta every day of my adult life. Do you have words to describe why that might be? You know, I think it is because it's the biggest small town on earth. If you really sit down and think about it, we all really sort of know each other. Yeah. Um, and so that's important to me, the, the closeness of family, uh, the closeness of colleagues here. You know, it is a rich pond, but a small one compared to say a New York or Los Angeles. And so that's important to me. You know, I had a, I had a decision not so long ago, maybe, you know, I have a seven-year-old granddaughter who I'm raising. And I had the decision whether I wanted to raise her in New York City or raise her here in Atlanta. And I said, I want an Atlanta girl. Mm. And so I wanted Sarah Smith Elementary School, for heaven's sake, right? So we move right back to Sarah Smith's zone. Yeah. Um, so Atlanta is culturally where I want to live. Just enough, you know, touches of big city, but all of the small town feel that um, I want to have for me and for my family. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it comes through because you and, and you know your Atlanta history. Um, let's start with the the. I guess who you'd say is the lead character, uh, Victoria Dobbs. So Dobbs. Yeah. That's a historic name in Atlanta. It is a hugely historic name. You'll find that nearly every person in the book is tied to uh -huh. a family name in this city. Not related to them. You know, Maynard Jackson was a wonderful mentor and friend. I am friends with uh, his children, um, Brooke and Buzzy. Well, Maynard, <laughs> we call him Buzzy in high school. Um, <laughs> so they're friends. But I had to divorce myself from the people I knew to spin new characters. But those names were just too juicy to let go of. Yeah. Dobbs, Loudermilk, mm -hmm. you know, and to think about the big names in Atlanta. Um, and so my characters bear their monikers, yeah. And, and then you name real people. You name Bernice King, um, Tom Huck, uh, Supporta. I mean, it's interesting. I was curious. Do you, do you get... Uh, approval when you mentioned real people? Did you just write it because they're in public space? Like, I I'm super curious about that. Depends on what you say about them, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So, and I would say anybody that was real, I don't think you said anything bad about any of the real people. No, no, no. And, and anybody who is real is somebody I know, okay, right? Gotcha. And yeah. so they're all friends. So Tom Hawk, Maria Supporta, uh, Dr. Bernie's King, all friends and great friends yeah. uh, have been for many years. And so, but I wanted to put a flavor of Atlanta. And so I populated the book with people I know and events that I know happen. So when you go yeah. to that, that mayoral debate in the book, where support and help are sitting next to each other, yep. that, happened. that happened. That happened in 1980. Really? And oh, so, uh, you know, I began to do that. I took a little dig at my wonderful friend, Bernice. I said, you know, you don't know Bernice King if you don't know she's going to be late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I had, so I had a little fun um, yeah. with my friends, but they are flat characters. They're not the rich and That's round right. that you find in the fictional characters. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to do people in the harm, right? Yeah. Uh, I wanted everybody to feel good about being represented in the book. Yeah, no, no, it was great. And you mentioned a lot of local brands. Um, I was curious though, you, you, the AJC is, and, and Cox are like in the book, but yet they're not called that. Uh, but yet, but you mentioned some other brands, even like small, like High Road Ice Cream. I noticed you mentioned them. Um, did you think about actually Atlanta Journal Constitution, or did you say I'm not going to even go there? Well, first of all, this book was written when I was high on High Road Ice Cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I ate a, it took a lot of High Road Ice Cream to get through this draft. <laughs> uh, this Southern Butter Pecan thing they got is I live for it. Oh, such a great. Such a great company, such a great history, and such good ice cream. Um, you just can't live with great ice. We live without great ice cream. The wonderful, the, the wonderful thing is that I worked at the Atlanta Journal Constitution many moons ago um, as a part-time staff writer on City Life, and you know I worked there when some of the greats, you know, were still around. Cynthia Tucker, Lucas Art, you know, you just gotta 
Bernie Holzendorf. You just go through the names of folks. Terrence Moore was running the sports desk. Uh, Kathy Suggs was crime beat reporter. So I worked with some of the big, big giants of Atlanta media. And I'm just a lowly 750 an hour, 25 hour a week part time staff writer, you know, who's going to school at the same time and raising kids. But I wanted, you can't write about Atlanta without having our media represented. Mm-hmm. But what I didn't want to do is do an injustice to the people I know, loved, and worked with. So I created a brand new paper, the Atlanta Times Register. Yeah. Uh, I situated kind of in the same location, right? Kind of. And I created a brand new Cox Enterprises. It's Delacorte Enterprises for mm-hmm. me. And they own some of the same kinds of holdings. Yeah. But I constructed a new family. You know, the Cox family has been amazing to Atlanta. Uh, The Cox Enterprises Company has been amazing to this city. And I wanted to create, since my media organization wasn't going to be, it was going to be an evil empire, it couldn't be Cox. (laughs) So I created a brand new media empire and set it in Atlanta. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was smooth, but but I like how you sort of tied it, (laughs) tied it together. Um, I do have a, a random question. In the book, um, there's a fifth grade social studies teacher, Miss Bateman. Is that a real person? She's real. You know what's so uh, awesome about that? I love that so much. In in my in my book, um, I reference a first grade teacher of the main character, uh, Miss K, and that was my first grade teacher in in Stone Mountain. <laughs> so I love that you did that. I saw that and I highlighted. It. I'm like, I gotta ask her. Jackie Bateman was my fourth and fifth grade teacher. Right. Uh, so every year on January 28th, her birthday, I still remember we would bake a cake or buy a cake from the grocery store and haul it in there clear through high school. We'd go back and take her cake for a birthday. Um, but she was a part of, you know, my real formative years. And so I couldn't, I couldn't name a teacher without her. Right. So uh, Jackie Bateman shows up in the book. Yeah. I love I wonder, that. I wonder where she is. I should go look. Yeah, know what? Right when this, when you were saying that, I thought, I wonder where Miss K is. Yeah, so look yeah. that up. Um, okay, so I would love the answer to this to be yes. Are you thinking of a sequel? Yes. Okay. Uh, the answer, the the answer is yes, and there is a title, King of Gods. Oh man, now I'm super pumped. King of Gods, set in Atlanta. Ah, oh, that's so good. I hope it continues. Oh. Focus around high school basketball. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is it going to have some of the same characters like Delacour and many, all that? Many, many of the same characters. I think the Delacours will kind of fade to the background, but they're present. Uh, Hampton Bridges, you know, are. This is like The Wire. Them. Yeah, like The Wire. He's. I mean, uh, it really is. It, this is getting exciting. This guy's going to break the story around a, a huge high school basketball scandal. Ha- Hamilton and will. So, Hamilton will break it and he will need Tory Dobbs to help him out. Oh man. I'm yeah. so pumped about that. You know, when I start, so Hamilton was, was the guy that I thought was the main character at the beginning. I mean, he's a big character, but then it became Victoria, but I was like, I was sure that was going to be, and then it shifted. I loved his character. I'd love to see more of him as well. I think you did with both of them such, such a good job. Ha- you know, Hampton came out of a couple of folks. Hampton, so, sorry, yeah. Hampton Bridges came out of a couple of folks. And so I worked in a newsroom with some amazing writers at the time. Doug Blackman, uh, John Blake, uh, Vickers, uh, Robert Vickers was back there on the back row. Lyle Harris was on the back row. And they all sort of lined the newsroom. I took all of them and wrapped them into one guy. I love it. And made myself a brand new reporter. Yeah. I love that. All right, so th- so there there is uh, there is going to be a sequel, and you're going to be juggling a lot of things, trying to figure out how and when to get that done. <laughs> how, how and when it is sitting behind a memoir right now in terms of the slotting, um, but I get to it every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. That's, well, there's going to be a lot of demand when this uh, TV series comes out. Um, we'll get to that. To uh, at the front of this, um, how do you describe the book? Because it's Definitely multifaceted. Um, How how do you sort of put a bow on it? We call it a political thriller. Political thriller. We call it a political thriller. It is a romantic cliff, you know, about Atlanta, realistic fiction about Atlanta, drawn on real life historic events. And so Maynard Jackson is in the book, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So, and John Lewis is in the book, right? 
right? Yeah. Uh, and all of those things are, I think, exactly where the bones should have should have really been laid. So that's really how you describe the book. But if there's a log line, if there is a what is this book about, right? It really is what will a mayor do to save her city? Mm. And for for Tory Dobbs, nothing is enough. Oh yeah, there yeah. is no limit to what she would do. Yes. Yeah. yeah, she's she's in in some ways an anti-hero sort of like yeah. she's. She'll you want to root, root for her, but you're really worried about that moral picture for her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so good. The yeah. ending is so good. Um, okay, so how did the uh, how did the John Legend um, TV like? How did that all start to happen? You know, I think, you know, people say the universe conspires, you know, for your best and highest good. I don't know if that's true or not. I, I, I don't know. But what I do know is that this story sounds an awful lot like it. So I'm online tooling around. I'm on TV and I'm talking about social justice issues. And this is right up John Legend's alley. He's following me. And we started to start this conversation on Twitter. So when people tell you Twitter's not real life, it's a poppycock, right? Yeah. So we get to be friends by Twitter. But this story comes out of WME. And WME says, well, we've got several production firms we want you to uh, talk to about this book. Get Lifted is one of them. I said, well, I know John Legend, you know, from Twitter. <laughs> and we go in and we pitch, you know, five or six folks. And we come back with five or six yeses. And I say that there is no way I don't get to do this with John Legend. So there were lots of really great production companies out there big names, big networks. Uh -huh. I wanted to do this work with him uh, because I knew what he would do. I knew that he would go and find an amazing uh, African-American actress to play the lead. That he would find an amazing, and this never happens, he'd go find an amazing African-American showrunner to be the lead writer on the show. Mm -hmm. So we'd be in front of him behind the camera because he, he is intentional about that. And so I trusted his stewardship. I signed an option with him and Sony um, guy named Mike Jackson who runs uh, John's company. They're partners in the company. And um, they signed me with Sony, who was their deal at the time. And we were off to the races. It took us a couple of years to do what we intended to do, to find that black showrunner, to find the person that was going to, you know, be the lead actress. Turned out to be Neil Long. Mm -hmm. I'm excited. Yeah. And, uh, but once we had our team together, it was a matter of weeks before we were pitching networks. And again, we had yeses from a lot of places, but ABC Network was home for John Legend, home for yeah. Mike Jackson, home for Get Lifted. And to be honest with you, three years ago when I saw this going to TV, I thought it was the brand new scandal. I thought it was scandal meets the wire. Yeah. And so it was only right for that to hit ABC as a network. So mm -hmm. it is in development today. Lots of things can happen between now and then. Sure. You, know, you create a pilot, they don't like the pilot, they send you back to shoot, they pass, or they decide, oh my gosh, this is wonderful, we're gonna make it lead Thursday night. Lots can happen between now and then. And we're so excited. we are excited. Uh, the lead writer is working on the pilot today. I'm excited for Tosh. Uh, uh, she's been a amazing, amazing creative around this. I listened to her repitch the story. And I just can't wait to see what she does with it. Is, is the idea at a high level that the, I guess I'll call it the first season, um, is a book or is it taking the idea of the book and running in different directions or, or is that first season really sort of? I do think it's going to be taking the book and running in different directions, right? Okay. So there's a lot of story in there. Yeah, there sure is. And then there's some stuff she can move to a second season. You know, we're so lucky to have that. So what's yeah. to happen to us? But there's enough story in there to fill up a couple of seasons if she decides to stretch it through. Yeah. And there's oh, some I'm, who don't survive the book who probably gonna survive the series. And some other darlings yeah. that you really like who survived the book who might not survive the series. So I can't, <laughs> you know, I can't tell you who's gonna who's gonna die. <laughs> yeah. You, you well, know. and one of the things that there is a lot of depth and backstory that you either hint at or get to a little bit, but that could be, yeah, a whole of, of stuff happening so uh man that's gonna put pressure on this second book i think i and think it, 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 it does it, it yeah you the next one has to be better than the last one right yeah. or at least deliver on 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 the brand that's out there so i have a little time before i get to that sequel but i already know what the story's about and i know uh. 
and I know who the characters are. Yeah. Oh, I'm so but excited. But they'll be like Tori Dobbs. They'll walk around my house at night and say, hey, I need you to wake <laughs> up and write your story. Because <laughs> I swear Tori Dobbs lived in <laughs> So, um, you know, my guy, Roman Borders, is my new nemesis. And every once in a while, Roman says, hey, I have something to tell you today. And I got to go write about it. That's the new Borders. So I see what you're doing oh, there. Roman Borders. Yeah. I see what you're doing. Gosh, you really are drawn. From... You see me. You see me. Yeah, I sure do. Oh man, this is getting good. Um, so, I guess the 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 last main question I have for you is, um, what has what has nobody asked you about when it comes to the book, to this story? Because I've heard I've heard some interviews, and you and I have talked, but like, there's something no one's getting to, or no one's asking that that you that you're interested in telling or no one's gotten i don't know well the story that there's two things right they never asked me about reclaim atlanta because they figured she made it all up i didn't (laughs) you're kidding you are kidding yeah no i assumed you totally made that up i didn't think it would be implausible but yeah reclaim atlanta the dark money independent expenditure campaign the first one to hit atlanta was during the 97 campaign between Bill Campbell and Marvin Arrington. And wow. Marvin Arrington cut a deal with a guy named Guy Milner. And that guy would go and create, you know, along with some others, this independent expenditure campaign. And they would secretly back Marvin Arrington, pump up his campaign in an effort to knock off Bill Campbell, who was the incumbent at the time. I had you know, going down to Florida to find peace after working for Milner <laughs> at the time. But um, I knew, no one knew who was behind the expenditure campaign except me. Oh, and how did man. I know? I brokered the meeting. I was in the room when it happened. You were in the sitting, room when it happened. Sitting in Guy Milner's living room. And so I didn't like the way that case turned out. And I would have been the only witness on the stand when Bill Campbell went and try to get an injunction against Marvin Arrington. And the, the goal was to keep Marvin Arrington off the street for the last weekend of campaigning. And they were successful because I was sitting on the stand telling the story of Reform Atlanta. Oh. Well, Reform Atlanta became Reclaim Atlanta for the book. And so I go back and re-explore the idea of the independent expenditure campaign in Georgia. And today, all these many years later, independent expenditure campaigns are almost, a, you know, it, it, it's just going to happen. It's a given, right? Yeah. Back then it was a brand new thing. And I wanted to explore what it really meant on the black white divide in this city when the social contract seemed to be coming undone. Yeah. A lot of people wow. called Marvin Aronson some really ugly words after that. So he sold out, you know, his heritage in South Atlanta. No, he was trying to build a coalition. I firmly uh-huh. believe that. Uh, so in this book, I explore what happens when the social contract comes apart. So that's the first thing they, they asked me about. And they asked me, how do I know? And I say, yeah, because I was in the room when it happened. Yeah. Was yeah. there a second thing? Um, if there is a second thing that no one ever asked me about, well, it's been asked once. And I kind of go, ah, how much of Tory Dobbs is me? And? Tory has no limits. I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I, I love the city, I think, and, and I think that pours through the book in the way that, you know, I appreciate, you know, uh, various sectors and I, and I bring them all to four. Um, I've been through a lot of the things that she went through, that, that power uh, washer uh, wand in the driveway, that's happened. Wow. I was on the other end. <laughs> wow, I love that. <laughs> Well, there are some things that oh. from my own life that I plucked and gave to Tory Dobbs, just like there are things from my own life that I plucked and gave to Hampton Bridges. And so there's a lot of me in the book, but it spans far beyond Victoria Dobbs. It spans into a number of uh, a number of the characters. Okay. Well, Kings of Gods, Kings of Gods, the next one. Oh, King of Gods. King of Gods. King of Gods. Oh my gosh. And now I'm going to have to research Reform Atlanta. You are. I'm going to have to research that. <laughs> you got to go, you got to go to newspapers.com and find Reform Atlanta and Goldie Taylor and go, ah! <laughs> oh my gosh. So what? exciting. What? See what? Yeah. Well, I just, I just really, um, 
I, I just, I have to say like, it was just so, so well written. And um, I, I have to imagine is your dream that you're just like sort of sitting on a lake writing all day like that. Is that the, is that the dream of every writer or is that, that exactly just my dream? My friend, <laughs> I have no greater aspiration than to get home is what I've said and spend all of my life sitting out on Lake Oconee watching the ripples in the lake. I mean, I that it. is my greatest. If I could sit out there and write stories, fiction mm. or otherwise memoir, fiction, you know, screenplay. If I could just sit out on my deck in the morning, yeah. and bring my coffee and write, wouldn't that be a dream, right? Mm. And so um, I'm often asked in my day job, you know, if you know, your boss wants to grow you, right? You know, what do you see in your future? I say nothing. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> I see ripples in, in a lake. I see ripples in a lake is what I see. Um, and so that can't be far off. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but just like the universe picked up this book and handed it to get lifted in John Legend and Mike Jackson. Uh, do something for me. Yeah. Well, thank you for writing it. I'm going to tell everybody they need to be reading this book. It's so great. Um, congrats on all the success and I can't wait for the next one. So while we, while we continue working together and hanging out, I'm going to be like hoping that you're carving out time to get this done because uh, I can't read, I can't wait to read more. Be careful. You might show up in the next book. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like I'll have to do something really heinous for that to happen. So I sort of hope not. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Goldie. I super appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Joe. You bet.